you're tuned in to the Mind of an Entrepreneur show with your host, myself, Sajda Wendy Muhammad. I am a multi-million dollar business developer. I have developed business and real estate around the world, and I want to share with you my mental strategies, my technical strategies, and how I made it in the world of business. So I don't teach theory. I tell you about my life and introduce you to people who can also share with you what they've done to become successful. This is a practical show. This ain't a theory show. You don't want to miss it. So stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. You are tuned in to the Mind of an Entrepreneur show, and I'm your host, Sajda Wendy Muhammad. And I'm so excited to introduce our powerful guest, Brother Derek Muhammad, and his new book, New Rules to You, later this evening. So sit back. Uh, we got a few commercials and a few things we want you to watch, and then we'll be right back with our guest. So thank you for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe while you're waiting. And jump over to your cash app and donate to the side of the house. All right, we'll be right back. Oh, my God, guide me among those whom thou hast guided the earth, and preserve me among those whom thou hast preserved, and befriend me among those whom thou hast befriended. Bless me whatsoever thou dost grant me. And deliver me from the evil of what thou hast judged. Surely thou judges and none can judge against thee. And he whom thou defendest is not disgraced. Blessed art thou, Lord, and exalted be the evil of what they set up besides thee. I bear witness. Nothing deserves to be said besides thee. And I bear witness that Muhammad is thy servant.
Assalamu alaikum again and Ramadan Mubarak. Man, how did you all enjoy that night of power last night? You know, I absolutely love the night of power. I even loved it when we did it during the pandemic. Remember when no one was in the audience and it was just Minister Ishmael and Imam Sultan Rahman just up there. Um, I, I just loved it. So anyway, um, how you all feeling? Um, how's your Ramadan been going? Walaikum salam. I see you all there. Um, welcome, welcome. Hope your Ramadan um, is ending up well. And if you think about it, I know a lot of times we struggle through the fast. Um, you'll get the benefits of it and you'll feel it. I, I promise it. And it gets easier um, as you continue to do it. But some years are harder than the others. Sometimes you have rough days and sometimes you have easy days. So it just kind of is what it is. Um, so alaikum salam, everyone. So I have been um, at a conference this week and the the two weeks before that, I had been doing the um, spiritual injection series with um, student minister Abdul Hakim um, over in Europe and his team. And, and it's really been fun. And it's kind of getting me back into um, my international vibe. You all know that's kind of where I like to live as a global citizen. And as the world starts to shake up and as the economy starts to do all kind of crazy things, um, I, I like to focus on global events, um, global citizenship. And I like putting myself in a position where I'm not as dependent upon the vicissitudes of our economy here and I can truly be a global and spiritual citizen. I, I'm going to do a whole show on that because um, I, I like to consider myself a spiritual citizen, a global citizen of the world, of the universe that is in the world, but not of the world. And so it helps, you know, when you can start to spread out because just seeing things and how things are in other countries, you know, we were talking about Africa um, the other day, and I was saying how um, just the abundance of wealth that's um, in Africa is it's life changing. Because remember, we were we were on the street, and um, my business partner over there, he said, you know, he said we are so blessed that it makes us lazy. And I said, what do you mean? And so as he was taking us around to all his businesses, um, he took us to a, a mining company where they were cutting out like sides of the mountain and finding all this quarry and cobalt and all these, these rich minerals and, and rocks and, you know, crystals and things that we just take for granted that we think are a big deal and they, they're nothing to them. And I was just amazed. Like I'd never seen anything like that before. Just really beautiful, clear crystals and marble and different color marble that's coming off of the rock. And then that was when we were at, near the mountain. And then when we went into the factory where they actually cut and polish the marble and stuff like that, there were like peacocks and turkeys just roaming around and, and, I was just like, look at, just look at all this abundance. And then there were, then we talked about um, food and they were saying how, as it got later in the day, the, the sisters who had picked all of these fruits and, and, you know, tomatoes and beautiful lemons and all this stuff that are selling it, they start selling it on the side of the road and really getting aggressive about it because they have so much produce that if they don't sell it all, it just goes bad. And, you know, not to mention he's pointing up and there's just all these bananas hanging from the trees and there's cashew trees and all the, you know, all this different stuff. And so we were actually talking the other day and he said, you know, we have to do better as Africans because um, there are so many countries and so many people that come here and they just rape the country. 
And he talked about the gold and Mali and cobalt and all these things and how, um, you know, the European countries come there and just take. And he says, and we kind of just let them because we're so spoiled because things, it's so abundant. And I say, yeah, I, I said, even the, the flowers that you had, that were just absolutely beautiful. I'd never seen anything like this. And they're just walking past them like there's some kind of weeds or something. I mean, they're these beautiful, exotic flowers that we would pay an arm and a leg for. You know, if you get the tropical blend of flowers, you know, that kind of bouquet, um, it's just huge. And so, you know, just having that conversation um, was interesting, but I know what it did to me just to see that level of abundance. I remember walking past the money changers on the street and literally on the side of the road, they had probably like eight to 10 feet high stacks of bills, Naira's, that they're converting to, to US dollars and they only want the crispy $100 bills. And sometimes they get too many dollars, the dollar goes down and they don't want it. But it was just the wealth and just that idea of not feeling the pressure of, of white supremacy and racism that just seems like it just calmed my central nervous system. So we're having that, you know, having that conversation here at the conference. And I just said, you know, it's nothing like it, especially when, you know, if you grew up, you know, like I did, you know, you started, all you saw of Africa was like the little starving babies with the flies around their mouth and stuff. And when you go there and you say, okay, I'm not seeing that. And when y'all have nice houses, y'all houses are nice. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. They got a big gap between the haves and the have nots, but um, they they got some stuff. And so I just, you know, we were just having that conversation about just the relief that being there has and just the relief of not having, there's, there's an unhidden pressure here that you don't even realize exists when, when you get over there. So, you know, just having that conversation. And then Dr. George Frazier today introduced um, a really powerful project that um, I'm blessed to be able to be on and to help him with. And this is something you all have heard me talk about, you know, because as entrepreneurs, we don't really get honored the way I think we should. You know, when you talk about the Annie Malones and you know, all of those types of people who made so much money, even Jean Baptiste, um, who was the founder of Chicago, he was a trader, he was a businessman. People don't talk about the powerful entrepreneurs. We don't talk about the trade routes, you know, and things like that. And what we do in America, the, the people who become entertainment and sports related millionaires and billionaires get all the accolades. And I'm not saying that the Rihanna's of the world and the Beyonce's of the world don't deserve to be honored. But I think people like myself who become entrepreneurs, we go through the vicissitudes of entrepreneurship and it's no joke. You know, you go up and down and up and down and you're trying to just, you know, you're always going to have some kind of up and down in a capitalist system. Right. So you may go through a situation like like you hear Oprah talk about how she just went up and down mentally, you know, with the weight and just all of what she was going through in her head. And then other times you go up and down financially. And so nobody gives us those kinds of praises. And I, I've been learning about just all these historical entrepreneurs through all of these preservation projects that um, I've been on. And I, I just think it's, it's, it's interesting. And so, um, what Dr. George Frazier is putting together is a Black Museum Hall of Fame for Black entrepreneurs. And I'm talking about entrepreneurs that you never even knew exist. Of course, you hear me talk about Annie Malone all the time with $17 million in the 20s, which is the equivalent of about, of about $200 million today. Um, yeah, of course, there's the Madam C.J. Walkers, but there's people like Reginald Lewis, people who started the first black banks. We had 12 black hotels 
during the first century of Black Chicago alone. Okay, we had um, a stock exchange or a trading exchange that was just for Black people. And we started talking about the Black entrepreneurs who started Black Wall Street. And there were tons of Black Wall Streets all over the New South and then New South and the, and the Upper South. And then there's also studies out there that talk about how right up out of slavery, when we were still segregated and still with the threat of, of um, sharecropping over our heads, this is before Jim Crow, right after 1865, um, we started so many businesses. And there were so many black inventors and so many black millionaires. And we they just get written out of history. Nobody knows anything about them. You know, we hear about people in entertainment or closely and loosely like BET and Radio One. We hear about that. But what about the entrepreneurs who made major contributions to the economy? We just don't hear about that. So George is looking at doing a project that's going to cost about a billion dollars to put on, but a huge hall of fame in Atlanta um, that is for black entrepreneurs. And of course, you know, even though he's way more than this, but I told him, I said, you know, the honorable Elijah Muhammad has to be there because he built the $100 million empire in the sixties and seventies when we had worse economic conditions, and you all know this, than what we have here today. So we, you know, we talked about that. And so he introduced that concept and that project today. And Saturday, um, we're going to be presenting and I'm doing a workshop on the, the revolutionary business models that have to be introduced into the system. Because as you all know, you all on this show are educated, right? Old business models no longer work. We can't take those old business models and bring them into the new world. Black people are not dark skinned white people. And so you have to build a revolutionary economic business model um, that is going to be sustainable, that's going to encourage intergenerational wealth, and that's going to transcend the vicissitudes of what's happening with the U.S. dollar and ultimately the ripple effect that that's going to have around the world. So um, that that we're presenting on Saturday and some other concepts about being a global entrepreneur. So I'll make sure I report back and let you all know that. But I think the most powerful presentation today was, um, and I'm going to try my best to have them on the show, um, a brother and sister. Uh, the sister is from Houston, Sister Asada, and the brother Damien, he's from the Crenshaw District. And they were talking about, you know, we call it urban historic preservation. They were talking about gentrification and reversing the impact of gentrification, owning and taking back real estate. Of course, you know, I had to add in there about preserving real estate that is important to our community and the threat of our history during this period of the Great Migration becoming almost extinct. And so it was a powerful conversation um, and they just talked about a lot of the work that they've been able to do. They even raised 11, is I think it's $11 million in Crenshaw for a mall. And they had the money, they had everything together. When they went to put in their offer to the city, it was turned down. And they gave it to a developer who had had a bad reputation and had didn't have as good of a plan. And he was white. So they're still working on that. But just the the power of real estate. And I'm telling you all, it's going to get even more competitive because I notice now that the, the tone they're trying to make like real estate is such a bad investment and don't get into it. And I hear people who listen to the pundits going, oh, commercial real estate is going to really suffer. Look, commercial real estate has always suffered. Commercial real estate has been suffering since the early 2000s. See, but what has happened is just that it's all they've always had massive vacancies. But what has happened is that the money has dried up because it used to be that all you had to do was produce a lease and show that you had tenants in this particular space. 
And then what would they do? They give you a mortgage or whatever on the property. Well, now these same people who've been sitting on these vacant buildings, sitting on, um, excuse me, I got to sneeze, sitting on all of this dead money, if you will, that that they can't pull out of these properties are now claiming, oh, let's create a commercial real estate crisis so that then um, you get the economics of a crisis. And I don't know if you all realize this in this economy, there's the economics of a disaster like a Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane Rita. And then there's the economics of a crisis. And so built into the economy is 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 something that allows capitalization off of disaster and crises. So now that they're predicting this looming commercial crisis, this is so that they probably can make it easier to file bankruptcies and get this debt and stuff like that forgiven. And these people get to walk away having benefited over the years on these long-term mortgages and leases that they've been messing over since the early 2000s. Um, you know, they just keep building and building. And a lot of these buildings never had no tenants, still ain't got no tenants. And now all of a sudden they're like, well, wait a minute. You know, it's a crisis. So that always pay attention whenever you hear the uh, them talking about a crisis looming or a disaster looming. This is part of how we're going to su survive the fall of the dollar is because we have to be really, really super clear that whenever a disaster occurs, there are economic benefits for those who are keen. And whenever there's a crisis, there are economic benefits. And this goes way back to the Great Depression, because even as early as the Great Depression during that time, there were more millionaires made during that time than any other time really yet in modern day history. So always pay attention to that kind of thing. And so that's you know, those are some of the economic things that we talked about um, today. And, the you know, the other thing that's important to remember is not only the economics of a disaster and the economics of a crisis, um, but also understanding what's happening with our workforce. If you notice when you go places, everybody's hiring. Um, nobody seems to have any staff. It seems like after the pandemic, um, nobody went back to work or a lot of people didn't go back to work. And so there's a number of things that occurred that a lot of people didn't pay attention to. Um, I hope you guys are doing okay. We were going to have a guest tonight, but I think he ended up having a conflict. So I just want to talk to you guys about some of these new economic indicators that you have to pay attention to. So when you see the carefully crafted PR campaign, AKA the news, you won't think that is something you should panic and worry about. Okay, um, but let's go, let's talk about labor force a little bit. We, you know, we had the the labor going, then the the pandemic hit, and they were pretty much even before we knew what COVID was, they told everybody go home and file for unemployment, and there were even loose instructions so that even if you had a job. People went and applied because I remember having big battles with employees who were like, oh, I'm not coming back. But they were applying for unemployment. And I'm like, wait, but you got a job waiting for you. And so it, it was this, these loose rules out here. So a lot of people went home. A lot of people did PPP loan scams. A lot of people were doing unemployment scams and, you know, still having a job, all of this stuff. Um, but then when they opened everything back up. Interestingly enough, um, hmm, where's the labor? And so a lot of people don't realize that what happened is that you had a large group of baby boomers who were still in the work market or in the market or in the, un, in the employment market who decided after or during the pandemic that they were just gonna take an early retirement or just take a retirement period. Why? Because since a lot of people got sent home and there wasn't any money being made, either the company started offering people retirement, that way they could not have to pay their payroll out of their operating expenses, but they could retire 
a certain percentage of the workforce and then have them get their inc their money from the pension funds or from Social Security or whatever the retirement plan was. And then they could save this, you know, these operating costs over here. Um, and so I, I thought it was very interesting that these e economists act like they don't know what happened. But again, they want to create a crisis so that they can benefit from the crisis. That's the um, that's the challenge. Let me make sure this isn't our guest. Uh, what did he say? Which we got plenty to talk about. So y'all know we don't never really worry about that. But let me just see what he said. OK, that was not him. That was somebody else. But anyway, um, and and still, you guys go out there and get Brother Derek Muhammad's new book called New Rules. Um, let's support. We're going to get to supporting and things like that later. Um, let's see what happened here. OK. Um, anyway, they still act like they don't know what happened. So you now we have a shortage of of skilled workers out here in the workforce. And guess what? This is creating a labor crisis. And what's the benefit? Now everybody's talking about AI, artificial intelligence. We got to bring in the artificial intelligence. We got to bring in the artificial intelligence because we're short of workers. And there's a lot of people that need jobs, but that's just the crisis that's created or them acting like they don't really know what happened as a result of the, the shift, right? in the retired workers versus the, the other work, non-retired workers. Uh, a lot of people started getting their VA benefits, um, just, just opting out of the general payroll. And the companies were structuring this. Um, and then once they started to do that, you had a reduction in the pension funds so then the overnight trading was changed. And so now you have this crisis. And so now they're like, okay, we got to bring in AI. We got to bring in AI. That's important. That's important. And we've already talked about this whole banking crisis and everything with crypto. So I just want us to be keen and to pay attention and to be aware of this kind of stuff because um, we're going to survive. And the problems that are outlined for the most part in the carefully crafted PR campaign called the news. Um, <laughs> um, really, to be honest with you, for the most part are not necessarily our problems. Mm -hmm. And I don't suggest that we um, make them our problems. Let's see what they're saying here. That's what I suggest, but hold on one second. Um, oh, he's saying he's backstage. I don't see him. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, let's see. Brother Derek is saying he's backstage, but our backstage does not show him backstage. So Brother Derek, maybe. Um, hmm. Maybe, maybe you can um, go out and come back in um, because y'all know the devil stay busy. Hopefully it's not because I'm at this hotel and something weird or funky is going on. But maybe um, you can go out and come back in because I really wanted to talk about this book. Let's see. Yeah, I don't, I don't see you at all. So he said he's backstage waiting. I am so sorry, dear brother. Normally when we have a guest that's backstage, it just pops up. Let's do this, brother Derek. I'm going to send you another invite. So bear with me, family. Um, we're going to do this. Y'all know we live. We have sometimes technical difficulties. So let's get brother Derek's, um, email address and maybe send you another link and see if that will work. And I'm just running my mouth. He probably is like, is she going to bring me in or what? But really, I was waiting to bring you in. 
Okay, let's see. All right, let's try that. Okay, so Brother Derek, I sent you the link again. And so let's see if that happens and that lets you come in. And um, it could be because I'm broadcasting from a hotel and maybe there's something wonky going on here. I don't know. Um, but let's see. Yeah, I don't even show them here. Okay. Um, Uh-oh. I think I just heard him pop in. I think that's him. There he is. <laughs> Assalamualaikum. Walaikum salam, dear sister. How are you? I'm good. How you doing? I'm blessed by Allah's grace. Oh, holy. Brother Derek, I'm up here just rambling, trying to kill time till you get here. And then the sis texts me and said, no, he's waiting backstage. I'm like, I don't see him. <laughs> oh, I, I didn't know if I was coming in on the second uh, segment of the show. So I was just enjoying uh, the dialogue. He was just chilling. Well, thank you. Minutes. Thank you for yes, your patience. I, 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 would, I wouldn't dare not show up, dear sister. I would not dare. <laughs> You know, I was going to have my cousins down there and he's going to strangle you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. How yes, you doing? Ma doing well. Doing well. Uh, past 30 minutes, I've been enjoying the dialogue. I'm hearing that you're at a conference and it's yep. so good yep. to see our people conferencing around the area of, you know, black business and the whole mm -hmm. idea of honoring entrepreneurs. That really warms my heart. Ain't that I thinking, yeah, I was thinking as you were talking, if 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 someone were to run the 100 yard dash in the Olympics, but they did it with one leg, mm -hmm. but they mm -hmm. came in first place, you would never forget that person. No, nope. because you're running against the fastest people in the world and then you win. That's what it's like being a black entrepreneur in yes, America. Yes. So those who have advanced in the field of business must most definitely be honored and lifted up as icons in the eyes of our children. I think that's phenomenal. It is very phenomenal. Uh, imagine. Uh-oh, Brother Derek, we got a different device. Ma'am? No. Do I have what? You have two devices on? No. Oh, no one second. Okay. Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay. So, um, so imagine this. Imagine this huge space, and it's also on the metaverse. Mm. Mm. So oh, you wow. can go out there and learn and experience. And I'm giving them like all the context, all the things that we've learned from developing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad House, because that's how we get a leg up, right? Yes, ma'am. There's no sense in starting all the way over. So I'm working on the community. I think it's going to be powerful because they were naming entrepreneurs today, Brother Derek. And I'm pretty versed in that, that I've never mm -hmm. even heard of. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. talking brothers and sisters who throughout history have done some amazing things. And I'm like, wait, you should have seen me like, let me, who is that? Say that again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was powerful. Just powerful. That's very interesting because we have been so oppressed in this country and it's been so difficult for or it was so difficult for our ancestors to achieve anything that many of the black business persons had to operate behind the scenes. So you never really knew their names. You never saw their faces. You know, you may attend a funeral and realize, man, this man owns. 20,000 acres of land, you may not know it because many of them operated in silence. But it's very important, Sister Wendy, and I don't have to tell you this because the reason, you know, when we go to schools and we ask our young brothers, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah, they say, I want to be a basketball player. I want to be a football player. I want to be a rapper. And then you have a few that want to be engineers, police officers, and things of that nature. But why is that? It is because this is who they see being celebrated in their household. Right. On Sunday morning, when 
the family living around the television, we're celebrating the football play. Now, this is the house that the child is trying to get attention in in the first place. So if the football player is who everybody is applauding and clapping for, then that's what I want to be. Right. If the right. family sat around and watched chess tournaments, then they want to be chess players. But I'm saying we have to lift up our business icons in the eyes of our children so that they want to be entrepreneurs and CEOs and business owners more than they want to be basketball players, rappers, and football players. It's so true. It's, 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 I just found, I was blown away that George is taking on this undertaking and working on raising this billion dollars. And you're talking about a huge state of the art facility in Atlanta, and we deserve mm -hmm. it as entrepreneurs. So um, I'm grateful that, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad House has kind of been the vanguard for all of this kind of stuff. And so now mm -hmm. people are really getting excited about preservation and celebrating us. And so I'm I'm grateful to be in that position. You know, I'm getting at the point now where I got to say, no, can't help with that. And, you know, got to mm -hmm. cherry pick a little bit. But speaking of that, Brother Derek, you know, I see you all the time on all these activist shows with my sister, Sister Sadia, and y'all fighting a good fight down there, just handling your business in Houston. How did you start doing that? How, how do you become that person? That's a very good question, Sister Wendy. And it, it really came uh, organically, I believe. My yeah. grandmother was a political activist. So, you know, as a child, I was a drug baby, meaning I was I was drugged to rallies. I was drugged to meetings. I was drugged to, you know, political canvassing events. She drug us everywhere. In your and your DNA. So, yes, it's sort of in my blood and in my DNA. And couple that with the fact that I just never really liked the bullies. I never liked to see people suffer. I always said that it would be very difficult for, for me to become a physician because I couldn't take just watching people bleed. It's just very difficult for me. And so as a young boy, I would sometimes fight grown men who I saw picking on children. At least I'd try to fight them. Mm -hmm. So it was just something that was always in, in me, the desire to be a voice for the voiceless and the, to defend the defenseless. And obviously, um, when I joined the Nation of Islam, um, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan's example was one that taught me how to do that, you know, without going to jail and getting killed. <laughs> you know, he taught me how to fight for my people intelligently. And, um, you know, the rest is history, dear sister. All praise is due to Allah. Well, you go hard, Brother Derek. It is intelligent, but you be going hard. You don't play. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. So tell yes, us about the new, the new book, New Rules. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, we just released a new book called New Rules some months mm -hmm. ago. And New Rules, in essence, is... It's my letter to my people, my love letter to my people. Mm -hmm. It is me sitting back, um, obviously as a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and looking at the myriad issues that we deal with on a daily basis. And I'm talking about those issues that affect our daily life. Um, okay. The issue okay. of illiteracy, the issue of economic disadvantage, the issue, the economic issue of us using money to hide poverty instead of using money to build wealth. So mm -hmm. this is it's just me trying to get into the psyche of our people to address some of these issues. Now, the book is called New Rules. And it's not that the rules are new. For instance, we talk about, I, we obviously talk about the mandate of doing for self, the, the mandate of becoming an entrepreneur as black men and women in this country, the mandate of you know ownership over um, being an employee. These are things that have been taught for decades. However, we have yet to implement them as rules. We have yet to draw a hard line in the sand of our culture to say, this is the way that we do things and we will not do things, you know, in any other fashion. So that's what it is about. It's my love letter to my people. 
It's like making vegetables a way of life. Exactly. And realizing that we don't have any choice in the matter anymore. Um, there's a part in the book where we talk about repurposing gangs. And I give the analogy of the wolves in Yellowstone Park. Mm -hmm. Yellowstone Park was a park that was inhabited by thousands of wolves. And obviously wolves are predators by nature. So they got together, they raised the funds and they drove all of the wolves out of Yellowstone Park. Well, when they drove the wolves out and a huge influx of deer came in. So yeah. the deer started yeah. eating up all of the vegetation. When they ate up the vegetation, then the trees stopped growing. The, the rivers began to dry up and it, it, was, it became an ugly space. Mm -hmm. So somebody had the bright idea to reintroduce a few wolves into the park. So yeah, they killed a, a few of the deer, you know, you're gonna have casualties of war. But yeah. once the deer yeah. left, the vegetation started to grow again. The trees grew taller than ever before. The rivers became clearer and you know more, you know, uh, bigger than ever before. Then rabbits start coming. Then bears start coming and pulling trees off of the big, uh, I mean, pulling fruit, excuse me, off of those big trees. So what happened is instead of totally uh, making the wolves instinct, extinct from that particular area, they just reintroduced them with a new purpose. So when we look at those who are, are so-called gang members and those who we see as thugs and goons and you know all of the steppers and all of these other things we have to find a way to repurpose their existence in a way where they um uh, have a constructive role in our community instead of a destructive role in our community and we got to create new rules to make sure that that happens that's interesting because I'm sorry. If, is anybody getting this feedback? I don't know if it's me, brother. It might be me at this hotel. Could I hear be. it. You hear it? Yes, ma'am. I hear it. We're going to keep going. It'll go away. Um, I was. I learned something interesting because you remember our first black mayor here in Chicago, brother Harold Washington. Chicago used to have a yes. rat problem like New York. You know, when you go to New York, them yes. rats big is scary and you just see them all over and New Yorkers act like it's nothing. Right. We Obviously we have rats in Chicago, but we don't have the rat problem that New York has. And it's because apparently during his tenure, he released a bunch of raccoons into the city mm. to kill the rats. Well, mm. of course, it gave us raccoon problems, but it got rid of the rat problems. And I just yeah. think that's an interesting way of it's an interesting form of capitalism, if you will. It's almost like creative capitalism where you take something and you repurpose it and change change it for, for the better. And, and you mentioned that about the gangs. And I, I think that's that's interesting. Here's another thing. We have these young teens all over the country who decide they're going to go to malls and stuff and mob malls and they go downtown and snatch and grab. And, and I thought... How powerful are they that they can call each other up and mm -hmm. all up mm -hmm. and all take these risks, mm -hmm. not be afraid? What mm -hmm. else would they do if they had a better purpose? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if you think, because I don't think that when we were teenagers, if I don't think you could have got hundreds of us to go downtown mm -hmm. and just mob the train station or, you know, go to the Galleria Mall and just be up in there doing a dance together. We probably wouldn't go. Well, our mothers probably wouldn't let us go, but we probably wouldn't go. Yes, ma'am. But they go without fear. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And I, I agree. You know, sometimes when we go into the hood and we talk to brothers about pooling our resources to open businesses, they see it as a foreign concept, mm -hmm. but really you've been doing it all your life. When you want to go and buy a bag of weed, if the if the bag of weed was $40, you know, you pitch in 10, you pitch in five, you know, 
these are principles that if we operate on these principles in reverse, mm -hmm. we can become very successful. Mm -hmm. But the question that arises in my mind is what drives the teams to want to execute this with such precision? Right. And, right. and I believe that it is because this is the way of, that they get attention. This, this is their way to get attention. This is their way to be somebody. Um, because the very fact that we're discussing it right now means that it worked. You know, they're getting attention. So right. we, have to, we have to find a way to create what I call in the book proper propaganda. The same way that, you know, we make a big deal out of them you know, uh, doing a flash mob in the mall, we have to make as big of a deal or, or an even bigger deal when one of them wins a science contest. Mm -hmm. You know, um, if we depend on the mainstream media, the white owned media to celebrate our children when they do something right, then it'll never happen. But you let one of them go out and rob a convenience store, he makes the news. He makes, he makes the news. news. But let him study for 30 straight days to win a spelling bee. It's as if it never happened. No coverage. So, right. So we have to use social media in, in this way to where we make sure that we're lifting our children up and giving them the attention for the proper thing. And the more they're celebrated for you know making great grades, the more they're celebrated for being youth entrepreneurs, the more they're celebrated for doing those things that that we consider to be nation building activities, the more they'll want they'll want to do those things that get them attention. That's a good point. You know, I think also for us as adults, we have to understand that the news is just a carefully crafted PR campaign. Right. right? And so I think what we do is because you can't tell the difference between the news and marketing in most cases. Right. It's always some kind of spin or something that they're doing. I don't care if it is a tragedy. I was talking about, you know, uh, creating a crisis or a disaster so that it can be capitalized. On. That's a that's a concept that they use regularly now. And yes. I think what happens with us is that we sit back and when a person makes the news, we're like, oh, you see someone so on the news and you see sister girl on the news or you see them on the Internet when they don't mm -hmm. realize that this is these algorithms are set like this because somebody's capitalizing off of it. So all we have to do is change the algorithm, unite, pool our resources, or we start posting, you know, the little sister or brother at the science fair or or whatever it is that they're doing to, to change that narrative. We can do that just with our unit. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I love what you're saying, and um, as I read up on and follow uh, your your activism in the field of business and, mm -hmm. and entrepreneurship, I feel like a lot of what you're saying, Sister Wendy, is just trying to get us to see our potential power, or should I just say our power? Our Ooh. power. Yeah, our power. Um, part of the problem is that we don't see our own power. We don't know our own strength. We've been so dependent on uh, our, our former colonizers, our former slave masters, and they're not even former colonizers. They're our co colonizers to this day. We've been so dependent on them for so long that we don't realize. It's like, it's like somebody breaking their leg, but walking around on a crutch, you know, for five years. Bro, mm -hmm. your, your, your leg has been well. That's right. Get rid of the crutch. You don't need it anymore. You know, I, I, I always say that the black man is like a seven foot man drowning in four feet of water. All he got to do is realize his power and stand up. Stand up. He can save himself. You know, you don't have to try. You can save yourself. And, uh, that's one of the reasons that when I was about to, to release the book, mm -hmm. I was about to go the same route as everyone else and, you know, upload it to Amazon because this is what you do when you write a book in 2023. And then I started doing some research and 
and speaking to some other black publishers and they were saying that, you know, if you have a network where you can go direct to consumer, right, then it would be, it would be, I mean, it would be economic suicide. Excuse me, it would be e economic suicide for you. If you make $100,000 selling this book, you got to split that 60-40. Mm -hmm. With Amazon, I didn't know the split was so right. Mm -hmm. But think about it. When you look at the network that we have, let's just start with the followers of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And and and, and its sympathizers and supporters. We have the power to create our own Amazon. We do. Um, where because we can create a, our own distribution network and network. So um, I applaud you, Sister Wendy, because I, I think once we realize our power, our, our economic power, then it's game over. And you know, I have faith, I have so much faith in Allah. I believe him too much to not to give up. I believe in him too much to give up. It's just like with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad House. I that I know that we can get the money together and we can make it happen. Why? Because somebody asked me a question today and they said, what are the top things that, what are the top two things that black entrepreneurs deal with? And I said, somebody, somebody said to me, they said, well, we know capital. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then they said, and we also know that it's staffing. And I said, but mm -hmm. here's the, deal. I said, we can solve that very simple. Y'all might call it old school if we just support one another. So if I see right. my brother got a book out, then it don't take me nothing to say, go buy the new book. If it means I got to go an extra exit to go shop at my sister's store, right. I, I waste time anyway, even if she costs a little bit more. I'm going to spend that in some other kind of way. It's not like we're not consumers. We're the number one consumers. That's why every other community comes to our community in order to get rich and build wealth. But we sitting up here worried about customers that we don't have and we really don't need. Mm. All we got to do is support. All we got to do is say, okay, sister's building a museum. She need people to buy coins. She need people to make a donation. Let me give mm -hmm. something. Dr. That's Fraser right. told me months ago, I want to build this uh, museum for entrepreneurs. I said, well, I'm still raising funds for my own museum, but what I can do is give you whatever resources that I've learned over the past 52 months. But if we just start paying it forward and doing that kind of thing, I think overnight we can disrupt Absolutely. the economy and we can supersede the fall of, of this dollar. Yes, but, but because we sitting up and I, I, I coach so many entrepreneurs and we always worried about what white people are going to say, what white people are going to think. And there's nothing wrong with having customers outside of your culture. But nine times out of 10, you worried about customers you ain't even got. Right. Yes, ma'am. You're just creating a problem for yourself. Well, I don't really want to say this because it's going to make wanna, some... Yeah, I don't want to sound too black. Well, who... <laughs> who gonna buy from you anyway? Right. You really think that some right. white folks finna get off on Malcolm X Boulevard and come shop with you? Right. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? Yeah, in, in any in any endeavor, you have to start with your target market. Correct. Start with your target market. And if you are a black business owner, it is wise to figure out what the community needs and find it to supply the need. Your target market is your own people. That's your so, warm market. I mean, right, so what are you gonna do? Open up a, a, a black owned beauty supply store and put a sign up with a white lady with braids? <laughs> you know, but, but I think in that, there's a hint of the inferiority complex that we have. There's a hint of hatred. You know, there's a hint of, 
you know, great, 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 great grandmama who still had to live in a state of fear saying, you know, watch what you say around, you know, around them white folks. Now I've been in the room with black people and there was nothing but other black people in the room. And they wanted to make a statement about white folks. Yes. And so instead of just saying white people and then finishing the sentence, they pull the, the skin or they go, you know, they, they whisper, yeah, ain't even no white folks in here. Why are you afraid to say, you know, white people? But I think beyond um, the staffing problems that we have in our black businesses, beyond the problem with access to capital, beyond all of these tangibles, which are very important and they're very real obstacles. I think the biggest problem is that. The biggest problem is the residue of the slave mentality. The biggest problem is the fact that you really believe that your competition is another black business owner. Mm -hmm. If I am a black coffee shop owner and you're a black coffee shop owner, we shouldn't be competing we should be collaborating because, in essence, our um, com- competition is Starbucks. That's who we need to be getting together to try to put out of business because they damn sure trying to put us out of business. That's exactly so, right. So, so, so this is really also what we try to, you know, illuminate in the book. You know, new rules. It's about a change of mindset. Yes. Yes, it's a change. I I love that the change of mindset becoming a lifestyle. I I tell people buying black and buying black Muslim should be a lifestyle. Supporting black and supporting black Muslim should be Mm -hmm. a lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So whatever you see your sister doing, I don't care, Brother Derek, if you don't ever write another book. That ain't got Mm -hmm. nothing to do with me saying I'm going to support this book. Yes, and, I, and I think we have to be a lot more conscious. And again, we when well, a messenger told us this, this table and this criticism. Mm-hmm. See, we don't realize that we're walking right into the spirit of the devil and in revelations when we're using all this slander against one another. Yes, ma'am. Slander is how mm-hmm. they've taken us down throughout history all the way back to biblical days. And, and beyond is using slander, false truths, negativity, right? Lies, tricknology. We, we know the history. But instead, what we do is we, well, Tom Burrell says the brainwashed have become the brainwashers. Mm. So, so what's happening now is that we slander each other. Yes, I, I had to do a live the other day, Brother Derek from the Scott the House page because, and I can tell when the slander's out there by the questions. So somebody said, hey, did you tear down all the walls in the house? Just a question. So you know mm-hmm. they're asking a question for a reason because somebody said that. Mm-hmm. Or somebody said, um, I heard it's not really gonna be a museum. I heard it's gonna be an incubator space with a bunch of desks up in there. See, this is slander. And I think we have to realize we living in the day and time where the agents and the hypocrites have been let loose. Yes, ma'am. And so we got to just be smarter because, you know, the the minister is successful. The messenger is successful. Master Muhammad is successful and they escaped those plots. So even as part of that, whether we in the nation or not, we got to be smarter than that. We got to look carefully into information. We got to decide that we're going to support one another, regardless of whom or what. Otherwise, all the white man got to do is just drop a little thing in there, Mm -hmm. a little rumor, a little lie. And then we go, oh, shoot, cancel that person. I'm not I'm not rolling with that person when the whole thing is a lie. Now, why would you ask me if I tore down all the walls? (laughs) Because somebody done said that. See, and if I don't respond then now y'all say, oh, you know, she 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 tripping. She tore out all the walls in the messenger's house. But you weren't worried about it when it was filled with raccoons. 
And we just had Savior's Day where people walk through and we got videos, but here you come with the little weak lie. So we got to be smarter if we're going to survive, you know, yes, this way of life that that the it's not even white people, but it's a way of life. Almost like these new rules of slandering, um, gossip, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. cancel culture. In order to survive that, we have to be so tight on supporting one another and mm -hmm. being respectful of one another that people can't penetrate it. That's got to be the new way of life. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We have to remember also that, you know, the, the Willie Lynch rule of law mm -hmm. was to create fear distrust and envy yeah among slaves mm -hmm. so you're gonna have that and then as you were talking sister i was thinking about the enemy's plan his plot one that he thought he succeeded in um not just in killing the messenger of allah he did not succeed but I was wondering like how 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 much money like how many resources did they really really put out to try to write the most honorable Elijah Muhammad out of history think about that think about that think about that yeah they, Brother they, Derek, they just a month, a month before Savior's Day I won't say who but an organization came to me and said we have millions of dollars available for you Mm -hmm. If and, and what we'll do is we'll give you credit for having us put him back in history if you allow us to repackage him. Wow. And I was real sweet. I say, you know, repackage don't sound like the truth. And that's a non-negotiable. Right. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm going to just, just thug it out. Thank you very much. I'll get through it. Me yes, and Allah, the grace of Allah. We're going to be all right. But I'm, but but that's a non-negotiable. So there's been that, and look how when I told the minister, he said, "Look at how they just throw around millions of dollars." Mm -hmm. Exactly. Think of how many millions that they've spent just to write him out of history. Mm -hmm. Um. So if they spent that kind of money, those kind of resources, and they put up that kind of effort to write him out of history, and you are a sister, you know, Allah has, has given you a mission mm -hmm. to preserve such a very important part of the history, then yes, ma'am, they're going to send their imps. Um, they're going to send, you know, their stool pigeons. They're going to send their, their <laughs> Negroes. You know, we have, we have a saying in the, in the FOI that uh, the white man is the devil, but the Negro is his messenger. <laughs> they're gonna send the Negroes at you, you know. They're coming. They're coming. But they do. We thank they Allah do. for your faith. Praise in the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, and we thank Allah for your faith in this mission that is a credit and an asset to us all as believers. All praise is due to Allah. Yeah. I, I just believe in them too much to give up, so it's just yeah. not an option. It's a non-negotiable. And I just move around. I, I don't I don't see. And the blessing is that I've made millions before. I made millions just to put in the house to put the four. Mm -hmm. So I don't need to come to you. I didn't get the four million dollars to put in the house from you. Yes, ma'am. Right. Yes, ma so, yes, ma but it's you know, it's just again, it's new rules. And that, that's why I like the title of your book and the concept is lifestyle. And it's a faith-based lifestyle that extends beyond our intellectual capacity. So I don't do anything within the boundaries of my intellectual capacity. Yes, Everything is in that space of revelation. Yes, ma'am. So I'm always yes. outside of there because that's where the magic happens and that's where he's yes. communicating with me. Because in here within my intellect, yeah. I mean, what we know what we know is limited. Yeah. What we know is limited, but our faith in Allah is unlimited. Right. Yes, ma'am. I agree. Yeah. And, you know, not only is it unlimited, Brother Derek, it's calculable. But well, that ain't how you say it, but somebody can calculate it. 
Mm -hmm. Right. So if I can if I can get a good gauge on your intellectual capacity mm -hmm. based on hearing you talk, knowing where you went to school, I'm studying you. Right. I got an algorithm with your name on it. Yes, ma'am. So I know your intellectual capacity. Now I can predict your behaviors. Yes. Yes, and I can I can predict what moves you're going to make. I can know what you like and what you don't like. So if you stay there, if I'm the devil, I got you. Yes, ma'am. Right. Hmm. Yes, but if, if you are saying, uh, uh, I'm in the space of revelation, I'm out here where it's going to take a lot to come to get me. They, they yes, can't get you because they can't trump a law. Yeah. I heard the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan say once that when you go into war and an enemy wants to attack you. He always wants to figure out where your power source comes from. Mm -hmm. So they come in and they wipe out communication. They come in and they try to wipe, wipe out food rations. What, whatever is your power source, they come in, they try to wipe that out. Because if they can wipe out your power source, then they know that they can defeat you with no limit of time. But he said that if your power source is almighty God or Allah, mm -hmm. how are they going to wipe out your power source? So we have to always stay plugged into the power source. Yeah, we, we have to study to show ourselves approved and always be looking to increase in knowledge. But our faith in Allah has to be, we have to recognize that our knowledge is limited. But putting our faith in Allah, we have the capacity to be unlimited in what we can accomplish with faith in Allah. That's right. Exactly right. Brother Gary, give me the website for you. Yes, ma'am. You can you can purchase the book at truthtrafficker.com. That's www.truthtrafficker.com. T-R-U-T-H. Y'all know how to spell truth. Trafficker. T-R-A-F-F-I-C-K-E or C C K E R, you know, the same way you would spell drug trafficker, but we're we're truth traffickers. We make a lifestyle. Um, we have made a lifestyle by the grace of Allah out of pushing the truth that Is we that dot com? That's dot com. Yes, ma'am. Truth trafficker dot com. Got it. All right, Brother Derek, anything you want to um, tell us before we go off the air? This has been great. And and I enjoyed being on the spiritual injection with you um, the other day, too. That was fun. So did I, dear sister. No, I have nothing else to say. I just want to encourage everyone to support Sister uh, Wendy Muhammad and uh, her leadership to make sure that make sure that the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's home is complete. Um, before the year is out, that's the goal, right, dear sister? The minister says, uh, I want this house done this year. And I oh, said, yes, so that's it, right? But those, those are not just your instructions. Those are our <laughs> instructions as well. So I'll be making my contribution here very soon. So me to um, we want to just encourage you all to please make sure that you support the Sajda House so that we can be found um, completing this project that's so necessary yes, for our yes. history. Yes, very impactful project. So thank you, dear brother. Um, may you. Allah bless you. I'm coming to Houston soon. So yep. inshallah, I'll see you. Maybe we'll broadcast or something, do a real big, big thing while I'm down there. So we'll figure it out. Set it up. Give my love to the cousins. Yes, ma'am. We'll do. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all, make sure y'all go to truthtrafficker.com, truthtrafficker.com and get the brother's book. And listen, I know I'm always spending y'all money for y'all because y'all got to donate to Sajda House. Y'all got to buy this book and support this entrepreneur. Well, guess what? Freedom ain't free. And we don't get to get where we trying to go and where we want to go. And we can't complain because we got to spend money in order to make sure that we are moving to that next level. So I thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your patience. We had a few little technical difficulties, but I think overall it was still a good show. Hope you all got some good information. And um, it is, sun has gone down. And so now we can have us a little water. Um, tomorrow morning, 
5 a.m., the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan is going to be on the Ramadan prayer line, the Uma Reflect. So make sure y'all check that out. You know it's going to be absolutely powerful. It's going to be amazing. Um, let's see what I got. Saturday morning, um, the Sajda Saturday morning coffee talks. We're going to be talking about slander and how slander has been used throughout history so that we can take that stick out of their hands so they can stop slandering us and have it mean something because we believe everything these folks say. Um, so we're going to talk about that um, next Wednesday. I think I'm on the Rise Magazine show out of Atlanta. So excited about that. And then we're back here next Thursday. And some of the powerful um, conversations from the conference, inshallah, will get clips and I'll be able to show them to y'all. And in the meanwhile, um, you see going across the screen, get your commemorative Elijah coin, go to SajdaHouseDonations.com to make a donation. Um, if it's small or large, we hope it's large, but it adds up. Um, and even the smaller amounts, they help us with smaller things. Um, right now we're looking for big chunks of money to come in. But if you got something small and you say, hey, I can't get a coin right now, then go right to SajdaHouseDonations.com and donate. Or you can go to Cash App, dollar sign, mode today. That's dollar sign, M-O-E-T-O-D-A-Y. And send a donation. So, all right, family, peace and blessings. Love you all. And um We'll, we'll share energy tomorrow morning on the Ramadan prayer line. Assalamu alaikum. You belong to yourself. You're an independent people. Created from the nation of free people. Yes, sir. You don't need to go nowhere but to yourself. Yes, sir. There will be a great Separate. Yes, sir. Well, I said it is on now. The college is meant to prepare you for your future. That the time dictates that if we don't do something for ourselves as a people, we will be destroyed. And the aim of the enemy right now is to take us out. We have lost with us. We held him as our guide. Yes, sir. We don't have to sit around here and ask the question, what must be done? Yes, sir. Get up and let's go and do something. Yes, sir. We cannot sit down. We cannot lay down. Yes, sir. We must get up. Yes, sir. And go to work. Do you know what real joy is in life? Visioning something and bringing it into reality. That's real joy. Do you know what the next step in joy is? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell in unity. Tonight, you need to fasten your seatbelts. We're going to hear from some of the greatest minds in the world. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of trusting our future and the future of our children into the hands of those who don't love us. I believe we need to revitalize black leadership.